Good to go. You're good to go. Okay. Thank you. So um, this is, I know that the title looks a little different than what was out there by like a few letters, but I got uh, creative and decided to just say off instead of authentication because this is just about authentication. Um, so just so you know, you're in the right place. It's it's like a, it's a pun, API, not poorly implemented. Um, uh, I'm Zach Lanier. I work for Acumont Labs. Um, I'll have that in an intro thingy. Um, so this is uh, actually my first time doing this talk, um, which I just finished like 10 minutes ago, because that's how it works. So basically, we'll talk uh, a little bit about what this talk is about, um, and then kind of just dive right into issues and examples. Um, and then a couple solutions, not really something that's like prescriptive or anything, but something that you could at least explore yourself um, and could maybe use in your day-to-day -day work. And then a conclusion that really doesn't answer anything. So about me, I'm Senior Research Scientist, which is a really fancy title um, uh, in the Applied Research team uh, at, at, in Acuvant Labs R&D team. So basically, Applied Research is the consulting branch of R&D. So scientist makes me sound like I know more than I actually do. Um, I used to work at Duo Security, and before that I worked at Acumont. So this is my second tour of duty with Acumont. Um, this talk came out of some stuff that happened at Duo. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they do two-factor auth stuff, so that's what spurned this. Um, uh, old net web mobile pen tester type, uh, and shameless plug, I co-authored a book that uh, came out in April by Android and got pirated numerous times. Um, that's not a good thing. So about this talk, um, we're just going to discuss some common issues, at least ones that uh, I've observed uh, or have observed by proxy uh, around uh, authentication, authorization, and security in APIs, specifically um, uh, web service APIs. Uh, not they don't necessarily have to be issues that are directly related to um, authentication or authorization security, but it could be something that, you know, an underlying issue that gave rise to um, uh, one, of those, one of those issues. So, like I said, some of these are mine. Some of them were discovered and disclosed by others. Credit is given where, uh, where due. It's certainly not an exhaustive list of issues or of examples um, or, any, or solutions. So, I'm not going to make you, like, API tax, tax or uh, when you walk out of here. Um, obligatory disclaimer, you already know what that is. So we'll just jump right in, and feel free to st stop me if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll try to keep pace with the uh, time slot. So legacy API integration, this is sort of a loaded term, but um, uh, things like SOAP, SOAP APIs, XML RPC, um, not fancy, shiny, web 7.0 RESTful things, um, uh, with the chopped off part of it there. Uh, when trying to get these to play nicely with the 2.0 API, the nice RESTful one. Um, oftentimes you might have completely different development teams who worked on the old thing, versus the people who are working on the new thing, and then trying to get those to like have nice synergy with authorization um, and authentication mechanisms. That doesn't always happen very well, so you end up with inconsistent enforcement of, of logins, you end up with inconsistent enforcement of um, authorized, uh, authorizations and entitlements. Um, you might have ina inadequate support for current standards um, you might have one API that uses something like OAuth, um, that's the nice shiny RESTful one, and then the other one uses some token out of you know some exchange that happens in that initial authentication, that then uses an authorization token for this other API. Um, so the really, is anyone here from PayPal? Good, good. Uh, so this, um, this has apparently happened a few times uh, with PayPal. Um, they have this thing called security key, it's their, their two-factor auth, uh, apparently no one really uses it anymore. Um, there was a 2FA two, two bypass, um, second factor authentication by the way, um, uh, discovered and reported by Daniel Saltman in March of last year, and um, I'll spare you all the disclosure details, but um, it came to, uh, as a friend of the company, um, when I was at Duo, uh, Dan, uh, passed off some of this information that, so that we could help them refine this and kind of do some root cause analysis that PayPal themselves failed to do. Um, and it was basically due to a discrepancy between this, this RESTful 2.0, like their API 2.0, um, and their legacy SOAP-based um, transaction API, mobile transaction API, um, that was really not supposed to be used by developers. Um, 
you could basically just use primary credentials to um, conduct transactions. So even if it was a 2FA enabled account, simply getting someone's username and password from one of the millions of dumps uh, was sufficient to send all the money. So an example here, you see the screenshot, this is like if you tried to log in from the iOS app, you'd get like the, uh, oh, do you have, are you using a security key? Sorry, our app doesn't support that. Um, it's funny how Dan actually found this. Um, he uh, saw this error and then realized that he flipped airplane mode on right after the, uh, he started to see his account screen. It would error out, but then when he re uh, disabled airplane mode, he was logged into his account. So primary auth was sufficient. Just some like little technical uh, blips right here. Um, redacted heavily, well not that heavily, but you know this is like the initial uh, uh, authentication um, to their uh, their OAuth uh, OAuth two endpoint, um, and in the response, you know I get this like JSON dictionary back, and you see here that my account is in fact two FA enabled, um, and then you see here this session token, and that's the session token that's then used to send all the money. Um, so the that was enough information to then just start to talk to this legacy API and do all the things. So it's pretty cool. Pretty proud of that one. Um, this is kind of obvious, but um, like bug inheritance, uh, and people probably have different terms for this, um, shared attack surface, things like that. Um, this is really, really super obvious, but um, underlying or backend components, libraries, think of all, all the numerous uh, open SSL Issues that have cropped up and how those have have bubbled up through other um, through other through other services and applications. So basically, anything that you're building on, if it sucks, then your app and API suck. Um, so an example uh, here would be um, My, MySQL had this typecasting um, issue, um, basically in the way that it compared integers and strings across different columns. Um, uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name from Venalit, but Jorn Chin uh, in Feb of 2013 disclosed this. Um, and it actually, the, the practical uh, example of this is that it, uh, it, it allowed for an authentication bypass in the GitHub API for certain users of an organization. Um, so, yeah, so this is real nice. Like, select one, two, three from some column where one equals a string, and it's like nothing. Select the same thing where zero equals a string. Oh, yep, here's the result. So, yeah, as a FX from Phenolet said, go home, minus QL, you're drunk. Um, Client-side enforcement. Uh, this is not obviously unique to uh, API security, but it's very common in mobile. Um, and mobile apps, I don't know, occasionally talk to APIs or some sort of web service, like once in a blue moon. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, uh, this is basically any sort of enforcement or control of a process um, or some sort of significant element, like an identifier or a, a, a counter being um, set or dictated solely on the client and the server implicitly trusting that no one did a bad thing with it. Um, you're all, this is obviously not news to most of you, um, but it is, um, another thing might be client-side enforcement of, of a logout. Uh, or termination of a session against a given uh, service or API. Um, that's like a WASP 101 type stuff. Um, but an example, uh, my buddy Mark Stanislav uh, discovered and reported this in December of 2013. Uh, we didn't really talk about who the vendor was the first few times we've talked about this issue, but um, statute of limitations. So basically the way that this worked, um, this uh, this toy, all toy now, uh, would have um, you could buy these credits, so you could send stamp, they call them stamps, so that you could send messages to these various devices. So you 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 know it cost you a stamp every time you did it. Um, so this was all done with, uh, from in-app purchasing. Um, but the client uh, would tell the server how many credits it had. So you could have um, you could say uh, like up here we have. I just checked my, how many stamps that I have, and I have 105 stamps. Uh, well, you know what? Now I want a bajillion stamps. So I tell the server I have a bajillion stamps, and the server goes, okay, you have a bajillion stamps. So economic denial of service, I don't know. They're like 99 cents for a thousand of them or something. But, you know, obviously that's not a good thing to rely solely on a client to 
tell the API what what is okay. Any questions so far? I'm kind of blazing through these. This is going swimmingly. Uh, information exposure. These are all very generic titles, I know. Um, in case you don't know what that means, uh, in, in the case where a response from the API gives you more information than, than is absolutely necessary, it could be sensitive session or state information, internal URIs, or, or WASP 101 type things. The PayPal thing is probably another example of that, where that session ID coming back was sufficient to then talk to this other very sensitive API. Um, obviously, a lot of this is used then to facilitate privilege escalation um, or, I don't know, stealing money from people. Uh, again, using Toymail as another example. Um, sorry. Uh, Mark also found that there was this, um, there was, it's a little bit of a workflow breakdown, but also an information exposure issue where uh, the way that the workflow is supposed to work is um, you ask to be a friend or you, know, you send a request to a child and their parent or guardian says, yes, it's okay, before you can start sending messages to this device. Well, in the, friend re the response to the initial friend request has all the information necessary to then talk directly to the device. So even if the parent says, no, that's not okay, you can still then just start sending messages to, to the stop. Uh, to the target device. So obviously, that's not smart. Uh, yeah, so this is the response, this JSON dictionary um, inside of the ID, and then like the email associated with the target account. Um, uh, it has all this thing, these things about like uh, if, if they're registered or not. Uh, but yeah, that's enough information to then um, talk to a child. That is creepy. So obviously, don't the, the UI would actually not display this, the actual mobile app, but obviously don't transmit that back if once it hits the wire, like it's out of your control. This is also really dumb. Insecure communications. What does that mean? Um, it's where you don't use encryption. Uh, yes, obviously this still happens. Um, so this isn't unique to API auth security. Uh, it applies everywhere and in the days of prism-like things, that's, this is probably important. Uh, so it could be complete lack of any sort of protection of TLS and SSL, or people still rolling their own crypto, or having uh, falling back to plain text after a failure, or some someone um, uh, doing like SSL strip, and you still happen to support uh, unencrypted communications with whatever endpoint it is. So this is kind of a slightly convoluted example, but um, the Izon, is anyone familiar with Izon IP cameras? Um, so like Dropcam or uh, Piper, one of those, you know, IP enabled camera, and the IoT. Um, uh, calls between the, uh, the device, uh, the app, etc., to any third party uh, API that was in use um, was all done without a seller TLS. And to, to add insult to injury, uh, your Izon like, account password um, was then ND5 summed and transmitted to plain text. So, uh, you know, go to Starbucks, wait till someone is checking their video camera, uh, extract their their uh, their password, and uh, crack it if you can, because ND5 is pretty strong. Um, so yeah, and then then you get like De Niro watching you, which is pretty cool. So alternate paths and channels. This was one that I, uh, I also thought was kind of cool. Um, one of the few, I should say. So there's like a CWE for that, so that's kind of neat. Um, basically exercising any sort of uh, alternate code path um, that wasn't considered uh, would, might allow you to sidestep some sort of check, right? Uh, maybe unintentionally or deliberately. So maybe um, hitting a different login form uh, in the same application might sidestep, might circumvent some sort of uh, entitlement check or something. Um, in this case, the example was uh, this um, WordPress plugin API. Uh, and if you're probably familiar with this, WordPress has plugins. Um, so there are these hooks around authentication and authorization, and you can basically shim yourself in to do additional checks, such as second factor of auth. Um, so what happened was uh, Omar, Abdu Omar Abdul-Jabbar who I worked with at Duo, uh, and was responsible for maintaining the um, the WordPress integration, amongst other things, discovered that uh, 
if a user, um, if a, an organization had uh, used, um, what is it, a uh, multi-site feature of WordPress, which if you're not familiar with that, it allows you to have like one WordPress installation with a like um, master site and then all these like kind of ch child sites, but they're all effectively part of the same WordPress installation. So if you had an account um, on site A uh, and actually I have a really nice flowchart that I made for a blog post. So Alice browses to site one blog. Uh, she presents, she's presented with her primary off prompt. Uh, she provides primary credentials. Did she pass? Yes. She gets second factor. She does whatever she has to do to go to second factor. Um, and she's logged into site one. Bob is also a, a member of site one. He browses to site two blog, which is part of that, uh, that same installation where he, did, he is not a user in that site, but because he's part of the master site or one of the, uh, the uh, sibling sites, his, account, his primary credentials are valid. So he passes primary off, he gets redirected to site one and he's logged in. So the problem was that, the underlying uh, issue was that in multi-site deployments, the plugin API didn't present a way to directly track the, um, uh, any sort of second factor or hooked off routine. So it was a kind of a hack to get it to like, update these, um, like set a new cookie value and like constantly compare that um, with every step. So it was really kind of funky, but um, that's a, that is an alternate path. I think it was kind of cool. And it affected pretty much anyone who had a WordPress second factor uh, off plugin. Uh, this is not rocket science. Uh, staff and shared credentials. Um, obviously any application that hard codes credentials in uh, perhaps for support purposes, um, or an API, uh, that, to talk to an API or something, that would be um, awful. Uh, any application that uses the same uh, credentials to authenticate to an API or a key, uh, API key that can be extracted and is consistent across every, uh, every transaction um, is bad. So shared API keys like Flickr, Google Maps, et cetera, they all have, those are used you know, to like kind of uh, measure quotas, identify a particular developer, things of that nature. Um, so there's this MoonPig API. I didn't even know what MoonPig was until like, well, this, this disclosed in January 15th. So I didn't know what it was until this month. Uh, Paul Price reported this in August 2013 and it was never really fixed. So disclosed it in uh, January this year. Um, basically, as it turns out, uh, although it was done over, over TLS, every, um, Every API request uh, was authenticated solely with um, a, a basic auth header, this, and, like the same credentials for every every transaction, regardless of who the customer was. So the only um, the only unique uh, identifier or value was the customer ID. So if you could just iterate through every single customer ID, you can access everyone's MoonPig account. And they're apparently they're like a greeting card printer or something like that. So you see here just. Uh, Customer ID over there, and then just the same. I mean, obviously, you don't have any comparison, but it was just the same uh, base call header every time. I couldn't come up with a good title for this one, but I called it Failure to Restrict Privileged Functionality. So, um, in the case where you have, say, a method or <clears throat> some sort of functionality that is uh, privileged but unrestricted um, to lower privileged users, uh, such as destroying the Death Star, um, that would be that would be awful. Colloquial example: creating a new user account as not an admin or not a role that uh, should have that. Um, uh, external authorities, such as like any kind of federation that you're doing, um, OpenID, or if you're you know uh, doing authorization through OAuth, um, if any failure there, that could like that chain could could uh, could be bad. Um, that could exacerbate any sort of discrepancy between what one authority thinks your role is and what another authority thinks your role is, or whatever the, uh, the API might be. So I don't know if it's like a confused deputy problem or not. So LifeRay, uh, is anyone familiar with LifeRay? It's like, a, I think it's used often by um, like medical, uh, med medical equipment uh, and uh, clinics and stuff. So uh, in 2012, um, uh, these two guys, uh, Danilo Massa and Enrico Cinquini, um, discovered that uh, LifeRay's uh, JSON API uh, had unrestricted access to this one particular method that would let you set um, an arbitrary accounts OpenID uh, identifier. So 
even you know even if you're an unprivileged user, you hit um, you call get user get user by ID just iteratively. And it's just an integer, so you just iterate for each one uh, and enumerate all the users. Um, and then for each one, call get user role to then determine who's an admin. And then just call as an unprivileged user this update open ID and just set anyone's anyone's open ID to maybe the open ID user that you control. So then you could set that on an admin and then just often you know off hit your open ID provider and then go back to the relying party um, and be like, okay, now I'm an admin. Any questions? How many people have to have a question? I'm like way, way, way too fast. Yeah, so they sorry. So the example that they gave was go to like myopenid.com and create a random account. And then when you find one of these installations that's vulnerable, you go through this process and then for admin Bob just set update open ID to Dan at myopenid.com. And then it'll be like, okay, and then you log in there, get redirected, and Bob's your uncle. No pun intended. So Bob. So I'm already like Way, 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 way ahead here. Um, so, oh yeah. Did PayPal ever fix the, the that two FA that two FA bypass? Um, kind of. They 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 closed the hole. They fixed the glitch. Um, no, they uh, they basically just made it so that. Uh, 2FA accounts don't work in mobile at all. I mean, they didn't really work before, but now they just don't return any of the information necessary to actually allow you to even get past step 0.5. Um, so yeah, it's and it also broke a lot of uh, merchants who were using that API. So um, like, I think Etsy, Uber, Starbucks are three of the like first first three vendors that come to mind. That, Will support PayPal, but if you were checking out using PayPal for any reason, it's like your account just doesn't work there either. So um, they did; they didn't fix it, but the issue is gone. So some solutions, and uh, a nod to to Dan over there for uh, mentioning some of these. Um, I hate XML; it's horrible. But uh, Wizzle Two Auto. Um, if you're not familiar with web services definition language, it's an ugly blobs of XML that you see when you're uh, uh, defining a, a web services interface. So originally it was for like you know SOAP SOAP based inter interfaces, uh, horrible XML ones. But uh, 2.0 added in, um, removed a few things, but also added in support for describing RESTful services. So um, you know you describe what this what uh, what the arguments are to an input, their order. Um, where the client should talk to, and uh, this is just an example that I totally like ripped off from W3. Um, but yeah, you just see like it's got um, this operation returns a list of books. Um, here are some elements that you will. Uh, here's an input. Here's an expected output. And it'll describe things like you would expect what um, what the expected output should be. But um, I think a little bit better than Wizdol. Uh, is Waddle, which is um, also, it's, it's Wizdle like it's still all horribly XML based, um, but it's basically Wizdle just for REST. Um, so it describe resources that you, that you will hit, the inputs, uh, and any parameters to, to any of those inputs, um, and the expected responses, including the expected content type. So that might be nice to actually validate that you're not getting XML back when you expected JSON, or, or whatever, or if you're getting text. And you don't have browsers that are assuming uh, mind types and stuff. This is submitted to uh, W3C in 2009, but it's not going to be standardized, I guess. Um, Sun submitted or something. And uh, Apache CXF, um, the uh, JAXRS, the Java API for RESTful web services. Um, for anyone who wants to like do this, um, I feel bad for you because it's XML. But uh, they support Waddle wow for uh, service definitions. And don't take this as an endorsement, but um, there's this thing called Swagger, and I totally missed the opportunity to put like, do, like someone like with swag walking walking around. Um, this is originally by 
Wordnik, I guess, and now it's maintained by Reverb, or I don't know how, what their relationship is, but um, this is their open, uh, open specifications, open source as well, um, and interface for, for building, defining and building um, RESTful APIs. I like to, think, like to think of it as an IDL, interface uh, definition language for, um, for REST. So it'll let you generate code, documentation, it builds a testing toolbox um, for you to, to go through and you know, validate things yourself. And um, there's numerous libraries for pretty much every every modern um, uh, web 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 e language. So the the this is just an example. They're like hello world. So it defines like base path, um, which each endpoint is, what the operations that can be done on that are, um, uh, what the types for each of those uh, those inputs are. So very similar to like WSDL, WADL, etc. Um, one of the uh, I like it. I like the way that you define these much, much, much more cleanly. And there's a really cool editor online as well. It's like editor.spider.io or something that lets you interactively use YAML to then build these. So if you wanted to extract it even further, um, it'll help you generate your IDL that you then use to generate more stuff. So it also, um, what's also nice about it is it takes into account different um, uh, uh, security, various security. That's good. Different security schemes. So uh, HTTP based golf. Um, if you had just generic API keys, uh, it also uh, will do um, supports. Uh, it understands OAuth too. Um, so the one thing that I will say it's not fancy. It's not going to like solve all the problems. People still have to define nice interfaces. But when it generates clean code and it also uh, has this testing sandbox, that'll at least give you know you an opportunity to kind of like make sure that. Inputs are what they are supposed to be, and outputs are what they are supposed to be, and a very nice, beautiful UI. So, um, this is just the example of their uh, their their like sand testing sandbox um, UI, and it's kind of it's kind of washed out, but it's it's cool. It has like uh, if it's a, a disruptive operation, it will mark it as like red, so you know that that is disruptive. If it's um, something that modifies uh, modifies something, but uh, doesn't necessarily destroy it. Um, it marks it kind of like yellow, and if it's just returns data, um, then they'll mark it as green. And they have other different. They have like blue. I forget what that, that indicates. So it's a it's kind of a cool way to just look at um, like schema for 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 every object. Um, you can adjust like parameters, and um, it's also nice. So if people are using your API, then they can they know what to expect. So. Yeah, so this is like the last slide. Yeah, I'm gonna this slide. So it's not a new, a new list. It's not exhaustive. Uh, I actually was only gonna do this about the PayPal thing and just like blow that up into a, a big, like very technical discussion. But um, when I talked to some of the people um, running OWASP Cali, they were like, you know, maybe something about API security in general. I was like, I don't, okay, sure, why not? So. Um, we barely scratched the surface here. Uh, I'm sure that this is, I mean, this is not even remotely uh, exhaustive. Um, and of course, what's old is new again, all this has happened before, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? So, uh, coming from the security engineer perspective, I'm handed an API or a site to an API and say, go test it. Figure if it's insecure or not. What, what would you, what would be a framework that you would do to an API to see if you could break break the universal functionality. So that's a good question. I mean, there are plenty. Obviously, a lot of tools out there. Zap, Burp. Um, you know, there are. Uh, personally, I would probably end up writing something or using something like Soap UI. Um, in the case of something that's like Soap based, obviously Soap UI. I don't even. I don't think it's really resty, um, but. Something that would at least I could kind of walk through iteratively and just get a feel for that, for that API. But ultimately, testing it, it would probably end up involving uh, custom custom scripting. And I don't think it's really it's not really a perfect science yet for um, testing like RESTful APIs. Yes, Jason. Every time every time I need to test an API, it's always burp and like the fuzz database, like all the strings from the fuzz database. And you know, just testing REST inputs in the URL or wherever they're being stuck in, right? It's, it's basic web testing. Yeah. Um, so you had a question in front, sir? Uh,
So it goes back to the stupid group of the and the cost of testing reasonable. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously there are plenty of commercial solutions that will do things like uh, a little more advanced than some free or cheaper tools. But I think in a perfect world, um, having some sort of really well-defined uh, schema or interface early on, um, like Swagger or Waddle or um, Whistle 2 or something that you can then feed into automated tools later to ensure that inputs and out inputs go in the way they're not supposed to, and outputs hopefully don't come out when they're not supposed to. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's not really a perfect uh, answer for automated testing of some of that stuff right now. I am to understand that some things are, are being developed around that as this all plays out. That's it. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that static identities are a bad idea. What's the better idea? So I really probably meant more static credentials. Um, when, I, when I listed that bullet point as static API keys or shared API keys are used, was, wasn't really meant to be like, don't do it. Um, I think the issue there is probably more going to be around like if it's a quota, like you're measured on a quota, um, someone abusing that that shared API key uh, could cause problems because then suddenly no one can use your app um, or talk to that that, that service. Um, that's real. I there have been there have been some uh, I don't know attempts to kind of I don't know maybe someone has a better answer for this. Um, some attempts to have uh, a shared ID or stat, you know, a, a, some sort of token that's used again and again, but have it like refreshed or changed or exchanged um, every so often. I think like OAuth, for instance, tries to do um, like yeah, it has a ref like refresh token. Um, I don't know if anyone has solved that problem yet. If they have, you should you should talk about it. Yes. Um, I do not. Uh, aside from like watching logs, um, I mean, if you know, there are plenty of tools out there like uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, uh, that whole Elk stack that uh, are pretty powerful. That will at least you can start to measure um, when, especially graphically with Kibana, when. Um, Request spike up or map them to a particular uh, like GeoIP. Um, well, now all of a sudden we're getting requests from a country we never got them from before. Uh, so what? Surprise. Right. So I mean that would be. It's it's probably going to be kind of roll your own or look at what what other people have done around that. Nothing, I, I haven't dealt with anything that's specific to that. It's usually like, oh, well, here's a, a rule, and we'll match, you know, like pattern match on that. Oh, it looks kind of like JSON. So, um, but I, I, I personally haven't interacted with anything that really supports JSON specifically. Has anyone else? Has anyone done that? Well, cool. Well, I know I uh, ended a little early. Um, that's fine. That means you can you can just sit here and I can regale you with tales of mischief. Um, but thanks for coming. Uh, I know I went fast. Uh, if you have any questions um, outside of here, um, that's my personal address. That's my work address, um, and that's my Twitter ID. Um, and hello to all these people at the bottom. So. Um, Thanks.